Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Pete Denby, co-founder of Hyperfinity, the decision intelligence platform for retail. This is To Affinity and Beyond, our podcast about all things retail with a keen focus on decision intelligence, data science and AI. On today's episode, I'm delighted to say I'm joined by Ian Shepherd. Ian's a former executive who led pan-European retail, consumer and hospitality businesses in both PLC and private equity environments with major brands such as Sky, Game Group and Odeon and UCI Cinemas. Ian's now a retail-focused non-executive director and chair and advisor to retailers, investors and innovative startups. He's also the author of Reinventing Retail, published by Pearson in 2019, and The Average is Always Wrong, published by Harriman House in 2020. Adding to his literary prowess, Ian writes Moving Tribes, a weekly newsletter on Substack about all things retail and consumer. It's an incredibly insightful read about the business of retail, which helps us make sense of an extremely turbulent industry. So Ian, welcome to the podcast. Well, Pete, thank you very much for having me. It's great to be here. Absolutely. Um, I've really been enjoying Moving Tribes. I think in an age of lightweight content, your newsletter stands out for its depth of knowledge and quality of writing. Can you tell us about its origin and, and what you hope to achieve with it? Oh, well, I mean, flattery will definitely get you anywhere. Um, th- <laughs> thank you for that. Um, yeah, look, I, I've, I've always... Um, I've always enjoyed um, writing about about business and the business of retail uh, retailing. So you were kind enough to reference the, the the two books that I've written over the over the years that are kind of broadly on those topics. I, I think to do that, you need there's a sort of magic kind of combination that you need of of on the one hand enjoying the act of writing and on the other hand being arrogant enough to think that anybody's going to be interested in what you've got to say. And clearly, I I managed to have both of those. So so I've always I've always written and I've always blogged and um, the, the the Moving Tribes substack which is a kind of most recent venture I suppose came from just realizing I, I tend to write something every week anyway on on social media but on on some somewhere like LinkedIn it kind of you write it you get some feedback and then it vanishes into the you know last week's kind of you know um, it just sort of disappears from the feed I suppose effectively and and what Substack gives me is the ability to build a slightly more coherent narrative over a period of time so series of posts on different things that are related so uh, yeah it's been been going for a few weeks now I've been delighted with the delighted with the reception really enjoyed uh, and particularly I think really enjoyed as I always have in in blogging the kind of input coming back from from people comments suggestions builds uh, i learn a ton from uh, from from being part of a, a a sort of an ongoing dialogue with people and so uh, yeah i gain as much out of it as anybody else does excellent and have you written about anything so far that's particularly piqued the interest of the audience perhaps even unexpectedly yeah i think i think that i think that um people are people are interested in uh, it's always it's always interested the thing that really lands so so i i long before um the substack came about um the the most read blog post that i ever wrote was um based on a visit to a town in fife in scotland called kirkcaldy which is not very far from where i was brought up um and i visited this kind of you know really really damaged um high street lots of empty lots of vacancies at that point the debenhams was closing the marks had already gone concordia was the town where famously a uh, an entire sort of shopping center at the end of the high street was put up for sale for a pound um <laughs> because it was essentially you know empty it was failed uh, and I wrote a post about that, which, which was which was not entirely despairing. Actually, I thought there was still some there were signs of optimism. There were signs of the community trying to do things collectively to to, to create pop ups to, you know, do things that, that that were sort of socially kind of interesting, socially worthy on that in that space. And uh, and it it really seemed to it really seemed to engage um, with people not just in Scotland actually, but all around the country. And so, what, what I found in this. You know, last couple of months of, of of writing on Substack, I've just actually, as we record this, published a post today, which is also about placemaking, is also about high streets and how we can kind of protect them. I think that's something that really resonates with people. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the, I suppose the other angle that I tend to come from is is looking at retail itself. Um, but from a kind of, I suppose, uh, I have the good fortune of having been sort of sat around board tables for quite a long time. So I'm trying to come from that perspective. So looking at how businesses make decisions, looking at how they manage the relationship with their shareholders, looking at how they 
um, you know, choose what strategy to follow. And that that that, that always, you know, th 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 those often get a lot of kind of comment and interest as as, as well. Excellent. Good. Well, I, I'm enjoying it, enjoying it thoroughly. Um, so yeah, keep keep up the good work. Um, just just um, more generally, then, um, you've been involved in the uh, retail and consumer industry for for some time. Um, what are the major changes you've kind of seen over that period, and you know, kind of bringing it up, up to date? What are the big things um, that you think are, are happening? Yeah, well, I mean, that's a big question, isn't it? And 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 I think there are lots of ways you could come at that. But the way I tend to try to sort of crystallize, I suppose, some thinking about about the changing retail landscape is to come at it from the consumer, the perspective of the consumer. Because I think the the reality is that the world has changed for retailers and for those of us using retailers as consumers fundamentally in the last 20 years um, for a very obvious reason, which is the, the growth of the internet and the, and the rise of the smartphone. But to bring that to life, uh, I mean, I, I often go back to the example because I, I, I remember actually doing this of, of you know, so 20, 30 years ago, if you wanted to buy a fridge, um, you would you would go to whichever white goods retailer was nearest to you and you would look at all the fridges and you'd be measuring them and writing things down on a bit of paper and, and, and try to figure out which one was the best. And if you were really determined to do some price comparison, then you would go to another white goods retailer and you would do the same thing and you'd be trying to figure out which models were broadly equivalent. But in the end, in the end, you would buy one of the fridges that one of those retailers had, because what else were you going to do? Um, and, 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 and what that, what, what that captures is the fact that a big part of the fundamental economic value add of a retailer in those days was essentially distributive you know the retailer was the the art of retailing was in some senses buying things from a wholesaler or a manufacturer bringing them to the store near your near you so that you could buy them um, and, and that was you know that uh, there was obviously there was promotion there was competition there was sk still skilled selling going on inside a store but fundamentally the, the, the what 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 the what, what retailers were doing was bringing product from far away to you Go and buy a fridge today and you have every specification, every price point and every customer review for every fridge in the entire world available to you in your pocket. Mm. And that that can't help but change fundamentally what it means to be a retailer, that that distributive role that you once had that I'm uh, fundamentally you're going to buy something from me because I have it and you want it and you're here in front of me. That is to a large extent no longer true. There are some pockets of retailing where it is. So, you know, the classic example, you know, the bar of chocolate in the motorway service station, I don't want it to deliver to my house tomorrow. Thanks very much. I want to eat it now. So mm. there are still some retail scenarios where the sort of distributive pieces and place and location plays that role. But, but in many circumstances, it doesn't anymore. And so, and, and so the question that, that if you boil that strategy down into something really pragmatic, the question that that poses for us as retailers is effectively implicitly coming from the consumer is why should I buy from you? Why should I buy this product right now from you? I have a million alternatives. I can price compare you literally in front of you by getting my phone out of my pocket. I can look at alternatives. I can have stuff delivered to my house. So why should I buy from you? And so much of the strategic journey that I think that retailing has been on in the last 20 years has been finding answers to that question new answers to that question uh, and I, I the good news is i think there are plenty actually that's not a council of despair um and so what I, what i've done I, I did touched on it in reinventing retail the first book that i wrote and, and and i'm touching on it again as i write on the on the newsletter the moving tribes newsletter uh now is is thinking of different categories of answer to that question why should i buy from you almost as almost as retail archetypes almost as um uh, you know, there are different strategic directions that a retailer can go down depending on the kinds of answers to that question that they might that they, that they might come up with. Fascinating. And um, could you give us an example of a couple of archetypes, type type of um, models that a retailer might follow? Yeah, absolutely. So, so you know, why might you buy from me as a retailer? Well, one interesting example is that um, you know I might be operating in a in a space where there's, there's just zillions of different products that you could buy. And I have, I have bothered to go and find good ones, ones that you might like, ones that work well together. 
Um, and, 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 and so in some senses, my archetype is, is that of the curator. Yeah, I, I, I have brought together products that might interest you. And that is, you know, if, if you were looking for retail examples, then you get to the, the clothing retailers. You know, there are tons of this season's clothes out there and what a really good, you know, even an independent boutique retailer, what they're doing is they're going to wholesalers, they're going to the wholesale marketplaces, but they know their audience. And so they're, yeah. they're picking out the subset of products that might appeal to their audience. They're picking out subset of products that work well together. Um, and they're bringing that back and they're laying that out in a really attractive way. And people come in and go, yeah, this stuff is great. You know, I can always find mm-hmm. something that I want. That, that's, that's, you know, that has value to me. Uh, and so that sort of, that sort of, you know, winnowing down to the products that, 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 you know, might particularly appeal to, you know, my target audience, you know, it really is curation. And I yeah. think that's, a, that's, a, you know, that's an archetype in its own right. Go in a different direction on the other hand. And, you know, a retailer might think, well, we're selling products and services which are really complicated. And, you know, our value add is we're going to know something about them. Um, So we're going to be able to provide advice and we're going to be able to provide, um, you know, sort of consultation around the product. So think of, a, I mean, I'm no, uh, anyone who's ever met me will know I'm no athlete, but think about um, cycling shops you know, a, a myriad of technologies out there, all sorts of different brands and things you could buy. And so a really good cycling retailer, a really good, you know, sports shop, um, a really good electronics retailer um, yeah. is standing or falling by their ability to say, uh, actually, I can help you. I can set this up for you. I can help you sort of get the right stuff. You may not even know quite what language to use when you come in to my store, but I can sort of talk you through that. And the archetype there is of, is, is of the expert. You know, I know something about this stuff and, and I can I can kind of help you with that. Now, now, anyone listening to this will think immediately, none of these things are binary, right? So actually, the cycling shop's probably also doing a bit of curation because they are also picking out the best of the available products and bringing them in to their store. And of course, that's true. So these things exist in, you know, to a certain extent in blends. But I think there is... Um, I think there's real value for us as retail um, operators in thinking about, you know, which of these spaces do we operate in? Are we a curator? Are we an expert? Are we? I mean, some retailers are all about delivering the experience around the product. You know, the, the, the you know the sort of experiential piece. Others are doing stuff to do with personalization and customization. There are lots of different ones. I'm going to do a whole series of posts mm. on my uh, newsletter about different examples of these archetypes and get into them in a bit more depth, but. The trick is to be really clear about why it is that you think that somebody should buy from you. And, and then comes the difficult bit. Uh, and I've said this to groups of retailers before now. So I, I, you know, you do something on a whiteboard and you list out four or five of these archetypes. And what, what I've said to retailers before now is every single one of you is now thinking, ah, oh, we're that one, right? We're experts. But actually that's, I wasn't asking you, I was asking your customers. <laughs> Um, and the question is, do you actually deliver on, on, on that? And so if you think you're an expert retailer, but you invest zero pounds in training your um, retail colleagues on the products and services that they're selling, then you're not really, are you? Um, and so actually, how do you make that? How do you make that real? And that journey, that sort of, sort of starting with what should our answer be to this question? Why should I buy from you? But then working from there to say, whatever we think that is. How do we make that real for our customers and how do we make it apparent to our customers? That's a whole, that's the whole strategy of your business. Everything then hangs off that, the, the products that you range, the way you design your stores, the kind of colleagues that you hire, the investments that you make in training and all the things that go along with that. Almost every aspect of running a business can really be, if you like, hung underneath this conversation about what is it that we're trying to what kind of answer are we trying to come up to to that challenge and 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 so it's a you know it starts as an interesting kind of strategic chat over a cup of coffee but it ends up in the whole strategy of the business it's a really and 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 i think i think i'd go i'd be bold enough i think to say that when we divide retailers over the last sort of five or ten years into those who are absolutely thriving right now and those who have maybe fallen by the wayside or the ones who maybe will fall by the wayside over the next couple of years, part of the division that you can see is between the ones who've really successfully answered that question 
and have made their business absolutely congruent with their answer to that question on the one hand who i think have been very successful and then those businesses that have struggled with that either they don't know the answer they haven't really got a good answer for why you should buy from them or they think they have but they haven't made it real they haven't landed it in the business for the customer and and, and i i think that's the i think that's the retail dividing line that we see in, in, in front of us yeah you can definitely see that um from a consumer's perspective as well we think about the um some of the <clears throat> retailers and brands that we might buy from um, online or, or on the high street. And I'm trying to think of some good examples now. And, you know, Apple would be a good example, I think. You know, Apple seem to um, span a, 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 um, at least a, a couple of different archetypes. Um, so I think you go into an Apple store um, because there's a prestige associated with buying Apple products, but also um they have experts uh you know experts on hand to help you to choose which product to buy and set up the product and get the most from the product so i think they they seem to play on that expertise of the store um associates so you can see how um that might apply in that that context i can also uh think of various uh retailers who who probably haven't quite nailed what that 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 why should i buy from you is for for them and and they're still really relying particularly high street retailers i won't name any names um but certainly rely on the the, the fact that you know you're that you're, they're on the high street so there's a convenience thing but if if you know high street footfall is is declining over the long term and that would appear a slightly risky s- strategy um we we uh, when you introduced the topic the first thing that came to mind were uh, grocery retailers so grocery retailers, I, I guess, are all about, you know, curating a very large amount of products and then giving you the um, the convenience angle so you can buy all those products from the same place. What, what we've also seen, however, in recent times is a growth of kind of direct to consumer brands. So it might be, um, you know, buy your Kit Kats direct from um, who makes Kit Kats is, a, uh, I, I forget, <laughs> one of the chocolate manufacturers or, you know, buy your you know, bottle of fresh orange juice directly from Del Monte. Where, where do you stand on that, Ian, with the uh, this kind of direct to consumer idea about? Um, so, if the if the if the point of going to a grocery retailer was the you know their their uh, why should I buy from you is that they curate loads of different products and they make it dead convenient for you to buy. Um, and this uh, and this kind of growth in in companies want to go direct to a consumer to sell their product. Do you think that's you know is there is there an archetype there is there is there sufficient reason for um, consumers to buy from lots and lots of brands directly or, or, or actually are they on a little bit of a hide into nothing yeah look it's a really it's a really interesting observation isn't it and I, th- I think the um, I lived this a little bit when I sold video games um, in 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 game group because that that was almost the perfect storm because you only really had three suppliers you had sort of you know Sony like Microsoft and Nintendo uh, and so the question for those guys about, well, why am I giving you some margin in order to sell my game console or my video game when, you know, actually I have, you know, customers are very loyal to my brand and, you know, might come to me directly anyway. That that was a that was a live discussion we had quite a lot. And I think that, the, the you know, my, my, my logic there was, you know, in a sense, that is that the shift to direct to consumer um, uh, retailing is is it is in a in, in a sense almost um, an example of not that the retail sector not having a great answer to the why should I buy from you question because you know my my, my you know my view is as a retailer you don't have a divine right to exist um, you know from a supply if you know you're facing back to a supplier and 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 you're you know looking for I don't know, margin terms or, you know, whether or not you're going to sort of stock their product, they're going to sell you their products. And your proposition is the fundamental of retail proposition is I'm going to bring you customers that you can't get any other way, or I'm going to bring them more cost effectively than you can get them any other way. And if that's not true, then they're going to go direct. So so we'll certainly see, we'll certainly see aspects of that happening. But the reality is that the, the friction cost of you know, buying all of the hundreds of things that you buy in a grocery retailer directly, you know, another van driving up the up the up the street to bring you your shaving foam, um, you, you know, is is so that that feels like such a clunky experience when you take it to its, its extreme, that it would be an abject failure of the grocery sector to deliver a real value proposition to you if, if that became a really big 
thing. And so the challenge is, you know, how do I make um, the experience of either coming to a, you know, a grocery store or shopping online, but on a grocer's website, you know, a sufficiently valuable one for the consumer that they choose to that they choose to do that. And, and I think you highlight with that example, and also I think with, you know, when you were talking about the, the unnamed retailers on the high street that might be struggling, you, you, you touch on a really, really interesting point, which is the corrosive power of inertia. Mm -hmm. um, because what happens is life changes um, consumers start to have alternatives for where they can buy your products, but maybe for a while they don't notice, or they don't notice in very large numbers. And so actually they do still come to you because you're there. And so in yeah. some senses, it feels for a while, like, yeah, there's, there's lots of other people selling these products and services on the internet, but we still have a decent market share. Customers are still coming to us, but the real challenge you have to ask yourself is are, are they coming to you consciously because you're delivering value to them? Or are they coming to you because of inertia, because they just haven't yet noticed that there's an alternative? Because if the answer is the latter, then event that's very unstable. And eventually they're going to notice yeah. and eventually they're going to go elsewhere. And I think you see that sometimes you want, I, I think of retailers as a bit like um, the road runner in the cartoon when the road runner <laughs> runs off the edge of the cliff and carries on going straight until, <laughs> until, until he realizes that there's only air underneath him and then falls falls down. Um, I think sometimes with retailers, you can see that. And so I'll, I'll read analyst reports on a retailer. say, oh, they're, they're still doing really well. You know, we're, we, we, you know, we're, we're, we're positive about this business. And you think, well, are they, is that, is that customers choosing them or is that just people not yet having noticed that there's an alternative? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, and another, uh, I guess, subsector of retail that comes to mind when we have this discussion are department stores. And we covered department stores in an earlier uh, episode within this season. Um, I, I was quite, I felt positive about department stores because when I occasionally do go shopping physically, I like to go to department stores because I think there's lots of variety and less kind of pressure from um, salespeople trying to flog you stuff. And, you know, I quite like it, particularly uh, John Lewis, which um, is, is in the city that's closest to me. So I did the podcast with, he was very disparaging about department stores. He said he literally never goes to them. So do you think department stores, are they kind of, um, you know, a, a classic example of companies that have uh, need to consider why should I buy from you and 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 are maybe struggling to do so so far. Um, or yeah, what's your what's your view in in this context of department stores? Yeah, it, it, it's fascinating, isn't it? I, I'm probably with you um, in the sense that you know I, I I'm attracted to the in some senses the romantic ideal of a department store, but uh, but but I do think and and it's an interesting challenge for somebody who says oh well department store that's an obviously defunct model it doesn't work is to say well do you ever go to a shopping center because a shopping center is just a department store without a roof right yeah. so so you know the the idea of bringing together different types of product that people might want to have a look at or buy in, in, in one shopping trip is, is in itself not, you know, that that's definitely not dead. Um, what's happened though, is I think the, this is actually an interesting example of the, of, of your inertia point that um, it's certainly the case that, you know, some of the department store models that haven't quite worked have probably changed too little um and have sort of seen people still coming through their doors because traditionally they people still come through their doors because they always have done but have not realized that actually in many cases what they're doing is they're selling too narrow a range of product they don't have they don't have range or you know, authority on, on on anything that they sell um and they're not really bringing anything to life so so what's what what why why would i come to you but then you look at selfridges and you look at Selfridges and everybody, I always use Selfridges as an example. And everybody else says, oh, that's cheating because they're on Oxford Street and it's all tourists. And, you know, that, that there's only one that's it. That can only happen once. But that misses the point. And it misses the point that what Selfridges spotted early, arguably Selfridges spotted in, in the 1920s, um, is that their answer to the question, why should I buy from you, is all about experience. Mm. Uh, it's all about the reason for being there. Last time I was in Selfridges before Christmas, there were elves running around. There was a there was a gospel choir singing downstairs, it, and the place was rammed. Yeah. Um, and you know, could can you not do that in Manchester? Can you not do that in Leeds? Can you not do that in Edinburgh? Of course you can. Um, so 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 for me, that that is a, um, you know, it, it, it's a, it is. You're absolutely right. A really interesting example of just having to be very very clear about 
what is the proposition we're supposed to be delivering to people and if it's about entertainment and experience and you know pizzazz then you have to actually do that and, and, a, and a tired kind of cosmetics counter full of you know people who don't really want to be there you know is not delivering that experience i'll buy that stuff online if i if i'm going to buy it at all but but um you know if you if you do bring it to life i think interesting things happen yeah okay well, i think it's a great subject and i think it brings um strategy very much to the fore much more so than it has done before but it sounds as though retailers need to be much more thoughtful and then deliberate about what they're trying to be for a specific audience and how that's going to be different from um, some of the competitive alternatives out there. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting field. So we shall um, uh, read with interest as you publish uh, more on the topic uh, via uh, Moving Tribes. Um, another thing I'd like to touch on in the podcast, and given that many of our listeners are data professionals, um, I'd like to ask about your latest book, The Average is Always Wrong. Uh, a real world, real world a guide to putting data at the heart of your business. Um, how did the book come about, and what are the key themes that you explore? Yeah, look, well, th- 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 thanks for asking. It, 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 it's a um, so I I, um, I, I I the first half of my career where, where, where I really kind of learned anything, I suppose, was was funnily enough, wasn't it really in retail, it was in subscription um, uh, based businesses, you mentioned Sky TV, I was also at Vodafone. Um, and those were industries which were, um, I suppose, faster out of the gate than much of the retail sector in terms of their use of data and analytics, largely because of course, a subscription business comes with a data stream by default, you know who your customers are, you know what they're buying from you, and you can do all sorts of interesting modeling about upselling or churn prediction or, or or other things and so you know even way back then in the stone ages when when i was working there we were, we were doing some quite interesting data and analytics stuff and so it was an interesting thing kind of coming latterly in my career into the retail and hospitality sector to realize that you know m- many of those businesses well first of all didn't have data that they could play with in quite the same way and therefore didn't hadn't really developed the sort of skill sets um we always used to um at, at sky many years ago we always the joke always was in some senses there are only three numbers in this business that matter uh, and that is how many customers do you have how much do they spend every month and how long will they stay <laughs> because if you multiply those three numbers together you have some sort of proxy to the value of the business and so let's make all those numbers go in the right direction so it's fascinating coming into a retail business and realizing that they don't know any of those three numbers so they're awash with data at one level because they know you know footfall and basket sizes and all the rest of it but none of that is customer related none of it tells you who's buying what or who your most valuable customer is for example so uh, i've seen a lot of retailers um begin to kind of wrestle with those challenges and, and and consider you know what what would what would life be like if we if we did know some of that stuff and what would we do how would we unlock the power of data in our business to to really change things what what drove me to write the average is always wrong i suppose was two things um uh, on, on the one hand frustration with um i suppose over hyping um and overusing terminology um so um you know i hear a lot you know it's dead easy isn't it to write a post on linkedin about artificial intelligence artificial intelligence sounds incredibly sexy um and i've seen you know groups of people get into really really in-depth conversations about artificial intelligence and i'm pretty certain that none of them know actually what it is so so there was a bit of that kind of terminological stuff i wanted to demystify but the other piece i suppose the more pragmatic piece is i've also seen retail businesses really wrestle with how do we make decisions in this area? What what investments do we make? Um, how, how would we turn ourselves into a data-led business? And I saw more than one example of businesses investing, you know, really very large amounts of money, millions of pounds in technology platforms, in hiring people into their businesses, and then sitting there two or three years later going, if I'm really honest, you know, we have nicer presentations at the board meeting now, but we're not actually doing anything different. So what, is there really a business case for having done this? And and so what I did was try to write something where, where, the, where the, I mean, really the first part of the book is a, is a terminology demystify. Let's, let's just talk about what data is and what it isn't and what it can do um, and sort of, you know, 
try and land what machine learning means and 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 you know some of those things just for a, for an audience of people who are you know who are kind of numerate and literate but not particularly coming from the data world but 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 the latter half of the book interestingly and quite unexpected i didn't realize i was going this way when i started writing it ends up being about culture and people and change because what i was trying to address was this issue of how it feels to be sat around the board table in a business to have made some investments and decisions in this space, but then to find that actually really nothing happens as a result. And so, and so exploring issues of kind of culture of, you know, what it's like to, you know, if you're the trading director in a retail business and somebody comes along and says, Hey, we can use a data model to make better buying decisions. That's pretty, that's pretty existentially challenging, actually, for that for that individual. And so, no surprise, you end up with some denial and some kind of not invented here and some resistance. So, so, so that final part of the book really is about how you might work a business and work a group of people to a point where they become more data and analytics led. And interestingly, the first book I wrote, Reinventing Retail, the same thing happened. The, the end of the book ends up being about psychology as much as it's about strategy. Um, but um, it, a journey I think we're still all on the sort of data and analytics led piece. I know there are there's great technology out there. I know that there's there's a you know huge and fascinating kind of network of businesses indeed like your own uh, doing amazing things with data and analytics around the country. Um, but um, you know taking that in as a retailer and really landing it and making it make a tangible difference to that question that we started with: Why should I buy from you? um you know is is a is a journey i think collectively that we're still all on yeah i yeah no i completely agree i mean every time we we speak to companies about these kind of challenges it's really not as simple as let's buy a shiny new tool and off we go that's going to solve all, all our problems it's um you know some it's, it's a much broader uh set of things that, that that would have to happen and a lot of um kind of cultural and organizational aspects that that need to be looked at to for these things to work uh, effectively so so i agree also interestingly i um spent a few years working at Sky, I think, um, after you had worked there. And I remember their data-driven uh, nature and their, their, their kind of ruthful commerciality, ruthless uh, uh, commerciality. But, you know, in a, I mean that in a good way. You know, they were very, very focused on, on data and analytics um, far um, before most companies kind of cottoned on to uh, its power. But, of course, they did have the advantage of collecting loads of data around people's subscriptions and, um, during the period I was there, c collecting data about people's viewing habits as well, which helped them do some really smart things about the content that they were creating or or buying, or you know how what extortionate price they should pay for the the Premier League rights and that kind of thing. But certainly a very interesting place to work. Um, so Ian, um, if if our listeners want to find out more about your either your writing or your advisory services, uh, where can they find you uh, online? Oh well, look, I'm, I'm you know any, anybody who does, I'd love to uh, I'd love to hear from them. So I'm I'm very I'm very easily findable on social media, uh, Ian A Shepherd on both Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, the A is my middle initial and comes because irritatingly there is another Ian Shepherd who got there before me, <laughs> uh, and, and 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 has uh, has has the uh, has the obvious ones. But but also if you uh, the, the the newsletter is you know really now fundamentally where I do most of my writing. And so if you Google Moving Tribes Substack. Uh, you'll find it very easily, and I would love to have you know any of your uh, any of your listeners uh, uh, who, who choose to um, get involved. Fantastic. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the podcast. Uh, if you enjoyed it, please subscribe via your favorite podcast platform. Tell a colleague or send us your feedback to Peter Denby at hyperfinity.ai. Um, want to say thank you to my guest Ian Shepherd. Thank you, Ian. Oh, no, thanks for having me. It's been great. Fantastic. And uh, we'll see you all on the next episode. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.